Thank you very much, Singh, for the introduction and Dhaman Singh for the invitation. So a very good afternoon to everyone. I'm very happy to present this talk on trustworthy and synergistic AI for software engineering. I will highlight the vision and also uh, possibly one way to reach that particular vision. So AI for SC has been a very uh, fast growing area since, oops, sorry, I the rest of the room. It's been a very fast growing area since the mid 2000s, right? There is this workshop now become a popular conference, MSR. I had an opportunity to write a review of uh, what was then a growing and new area in 2009. And today, like it is one of the most popular topic in software engineering conferences, including in Nixie. So in this talk, I would like to put forward uh, two directions that I believe uh, may change or will change uh, AI for SE for the better in the future. So one direction that I like to put forward is uh, this direction of trustworthy AI for software engineering. And another direction that is closely linked to it is this area called uh, synergistic AI for SE. So we're going to talk a little bit about these two different directions that are related to each other. So first of all, about trustworthy AI for SE. So uh, why do we need trustworthy AI for SE? Well, if developer does not trust AI for SE tool, they will not use it, right? So are there problems with trustworthiness of AI for SE tools? Yes, there are. So for example, we do a study with hundreds of practitioners in Microsoft, and then a few people mentioned a few things, like for example, they expect tools to be able to provide explanations not just output, but reasons why certain output is being provided. And people also expect these tools to provide certain kind of guarantees. Otherwise, disastrous results may happen if we use AI for SE tools to automate certain activities. And many of the current tools today that do AI for SE do not provide guarantees and also do not provide any kind of explanations. So I think there is a lot that can be done in this area of AI for SE. And uh, how about uh, ChatGPT, which is currently very popular, right? Everyone is looking into it. Are there issues with trustworthiness of that tool that can be considered AI for SE tools as well? Well, they are, and these are two articles for news, right? For example, from BBC, it say, friend or foe, can computer coders trust ChatGPT? So the questions of trust is, I think, very important, and I think it's, uh, it's an interesting topic for us to look into this trustworthy direction of AI for SC. How can we provide guarantees? How we can provide explanations? Another direction that I think is interesting that is related to trust is this synergistic AI for SC. What does it mean? Well, I look in the definition of this word synergy in the Oxford Dictionary, and it mentions this. There's a cooperation between multiple agents so that the combined effect is greater than the sum of its parts, right? So when human work alone, AI work alone, ideally when they work together, right, the combined effect should be bigger than the individual parts. Right. Are there issues with the synergy between human and AI agents? Well, let's consider the common setting, one-to-one -one setting. One developer working with one intelligent agent. Are there issues? Well, there are often issues. One of the common issues is this thing referred to as the false positives. Right? So developers do not like false positives. So if they see a lot of false positive, they will lose faith. They will lose trust on this AI for SE tools, and they cannot synergize with it. It will be similar to the situation in this famous fables, the boy who cried wolf, right? At the end, nobody trusts the boy. So similarly, AI for SE, if it has too many false positives and we do not handle it well, then developers will not trust, cannot synergize with AI for SE. But the problem with synergy is not just trust. It goes beyond that. So as humans, we are resistant to make changes. When new things are introduced, likely we say, no, we uh, want to start with the old things. And there is this thing called the change process that is studied a lot in management and other areas. So what they say when the foreign element is being introduced, including AI for SE, Initially, there won't be success. Rather, there will be resistance, even chaos. And eventually, when people figure out how to do it well, then we can go up and eventually reach the new status quo. 
And at the moment, I believe there are not too many studies on measuring this change process. How difficult the change process is when we inject a new foreign element, maybe AI for SE tools. Right? How can we minimize this time here so that we can eventually get to a new status quo that is better in the shortest amount of time? I think we need to, to do more research into this so that we can better synergize AI for SE with humans. So there are other problems that I think is open. So another problem is that many AI for SE tools focus on one task at a time. For example, code generation, management of bug reports, AI-powered testing, and so on. On the other hand, humans think as a workflow. Right? So they consider different parts of the workflow and consider things in a holistic manner. So I think for better synergy, AI for SE tools should also consider holistically the entire workflow rather than just one task in isolation. Another problem is that many of the tools have limited interactivity. Of course, we are excited today with ChatGPT. There is can, can be interactive between a human and this AI. But still, current ChatGPT are far from two developers working together in a pair programming session, synergistically helping one another. So I think there's a lot of problems, a lot of exciting opportunities in this area of synergistic AI for SE. I think we should work more on this direction. So what can we uh, do uh, with uh, like N and M setting? And this setting has not been considered much where there are multiple developers and multiple intelligent agents, how can they synergize well with each other? That's also an open problem. So what can we realize? Let's say we have this trustworthy and also synergistic AI for SE. This talk is part of the future of software engineering. So let me dream a little bit and then share with you what is one possible reality. So let me try to put forward this vision 2033. Right, 10 years from now, right? This is just a vision, right? So I think in 10 years time, we can possibly have this symbiotic workforce. And this workforce consists of two elements. One element is autonomous, responsible, and also intelligent bots. And these bots would need to work well, synergistically with software engineers. And I believe this will be a new way for us to engineer software or software engineering 2.0. And uh, software engineering 2.0 will involve bots helping humans, and we have seen this today, but it will go beyond this. It's not just bots working with humans. Bots need to transition from smart tools to smart workmate. I don't know if you know this uh, science fiction here. <laughs> right, so what is the difference between the two? smart tool and smart workmate. So the difference is this quality of responsible autonomy. And these bots need to be able to help humans, not only as assistant, but also as peer and even as manager. And they need to work not only in one-to-one -one setting, but they need to work together in a team. So there will be multiple humans that need to synergize with multiple bots. There'll be human-to-human -human interaction, human and bot interaction, and also bot and bot interaction. If two bots need to work together, how can they discover the capabilities of each other and work well together? I think that's an interesting problem to solve. And this shouldn't be just be a static setting, just having like three humans working with two bots, but it should support a dynamic setting. While new bots joining the team, New bots, uh, old bots leaving the team, people onboarding, people leaving the team. So how can we support this dynamic setting? I think it's an open problem. Moreover, this symbiotic workforce need to be built upon a solid foundations. Foundations of what? Foundations of legal rules, ethical principles, also economic considerations, so that we can have a sustainable workforce that can run for a long term. So this is my vision for this uh, software engineering 2.0 symbiotic workforce of autonomous, responsible, intelligent bots and software engineers. So how to make this vision a reality? I think we need to work on trustworthy and synergistic AI for SE. So trustworthy, we need to make these tools more intelligent than they are today. 
so that people can trust them, people can work with them. And we also need to understand better what trust means. So how can exactly a human trust a bot for a particular task? And how can we make this explanation more personalized? And in the area of synergy, we need to figure out what are the barriers between a human and AI for SE collaborating together. What are the costs of their collaboration? How can we manage the change process? And how can we mitigate some teething issues, for example, related to false positives? And related to synergy, we also need to build solutions that are holistic. They are workflow aware, also interactive. Of course, we should not ignore also the legal, ethical, and economic aspects. The last part is particularly very important because if we see the news today, right, there are issues with lawsuit. There are also issues related to chat GPT taking up our jobs, including software engineers, ethical issues there. And more recently, there are news like Jeffrey Hinton, right, the founder of like a deep learning and AI pioneer quits Google to highlight the dangers of this AI. Are there dangers with AI for SE? I don't think so, but I think we should start talking and discussing about it to ensure that AI for SE can synergize with humans and people can really trust them. So uh, in Singapore, just want to highlight that we have a project that's gonna work on this uh, trustworthy AI for SE. So this is a five years project that's gonna start sometime next month. And we're looking forward for collaborations and also people to join us, their positions available. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and looking forward for exciting discussion after this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for, for having me at the session. And so some of the themes of my talk are actually gonna be very similar to what you just saw in the previous talk. But I think that's also an exciting time that everyone is thinking about how AI will change the future. And so what I'm gonna focus in my talk is basically how AI and ML are going to be working in the future with software engineers. And I wanna share a little bit of my, my recent AI journey. So I've been, I've been doing mining software repositories for almost 20 years now, but like today I wanna focus on the last two, two years, less than two years actually, working at Microsoft on projects related to AI. And so, so just a disclaimer, a lot of it is from the eyes of a Microsoft employee just to make clear if there's like a lot of innovation happening in that space at many other companies, not just Microsoft. And so my first like real big exposure recently was like two years ago when, when GitHub Copilot was really released. And what our team started doing at this point of time is basically looking into how people use Copilot and what we're using it for. So if you have never heard of GitHub Copilot, it is basically a really intelligent code completion or code generation system within the IDE that can generate many lines of code that people can use for the software. And so what we were basically focusing in several research projects, which we just recently published in ACMQ in a paper called Taking Flight with Copilot, was on how people are using GitHub Copilot. So basically we're looking into different forum analyses and where people are showing off all the amazing things that they're doing. And one really surprising thing was like how wide of a range of application GitHub Copilot had. So initially we just thought of it as like really smart code completion, but it actually had many more applications. Like some people were using it for accessibility to improve uh, accessibility for software engineers. I was using it for, for translation of, of documentation or or text messages in the software system. And then we also did various user studies where we looked into how, how people are working with Copilot, how we are adjusting for recommendations and also how it changes their, their productivity. And since that study, so that was like 2021, 2022, so less, uh, like about two years ago, a lot of things have changed. And also one really interesting observation is that the speed of innovation has dramatically improved. So if, you just, if I just think back of the last year, um, basically in, I think, October or so, like ChatGPT was released, 
and it was one of the first systems to really reach 1 million and 100 million users very, very quickly. And it exposed a large number of people to what generative AI can do for them and how they can use it to do clever things. And people were playing around with AI systems. And then more recently, ChatGPT got like an update. So basically, GPT 3.5 was directly updated to GPT 4. And GPT 4 is much more powerful than GPT 3.5. So its capabilities are dramatically improved. And also what happened is, and this all happened in the past few months, the releases, but people have been working on it for a while, is that we're also seeing products which are actually using these generative models to, to help the end user be more productive or find information more quickly. So for example, Microsoft released an update to its search engine, Bing Chat, which is using GPT models on search results, and it can help you to basically get information faster. Or also Microsoft Office is basically building in GPT uh, into its Office products like Word and PowerPoint, and this will help you to create presentations, for example, almost automatically from documents. And I want to highlight one more paper uh, for this from Microsoft, which is, which is called the, the Sparks paper, which is looking into artificial general intelligence within GPT-4. And we are basically seeing is if GPT-4 is getting close to uh, more like human intelligence. And so I extracted two charts from this paper, which I find really fascinating. So one of them is we are basically running GPT-4 on mock technical interviews on lead code. And GPT-4 was as efficient that it could potentially be hired as a software engineer in like a major IT company. And the other finding observation that we made in the paper is that GPT-4, as it is right now, has like a high proficiency in writing focus programs that depend on existing public libraries. And this is like comparable to the average <laughs> software engineer. So, and so that is GPT-4, and one thing to keep in mind is that these models keep evolving and get more powerful, and we don't know yet how, how good whatever comes after GPT-4 will perform. So, as most people, when I was preparing this talk, I, I also asked ChatGPT on what would be interesting to highlight to this audience. So my prompt was, you are a friendly, optimistic AI model, that is presenting at an important software engineering research conference. What will you share with your audience? And I'm just gonna replay what ChatGPT says, including the applause. Um, <laughs> but, but I also like the esteemed researchers, software engineers, and distinguished guests. So it is it's very confident of itself. But also like what really stuck out to me is that um, even for like the training data for ChatGPT is a few years old, it actually had a really good idea of what AI is used for in software engineering right now, right? So it highlighted automatic code reviews. So that's where already AI is being used. Um, it said AI powered IDEs, which is also true. And AI systems like, like me, like ChatGPT. So again, um, it was, was interesting. And then it gave us some directions for the future. So looking forward, like the many exciting possibilities, and uh, I put them on the slide, but what also really stood out to me is that I did multiple experiments like with different prompts, but always ChatGPT was highlighting ethical AI development, uh, that because AI systems get more complex and influential, we have to make sure that they're developed in an ethical way that basically um, is fair, transparent, and also yeah, is in society's best interest. And then also, um, these are not dreams, these are reality, realities that are all being shaped by you. So, so once you leave the session, it's your responsibility to, to build all of these things. So I wanna share five directions that I think are really important for us to think about. Uh, so the first direction is basically very similar to what uh, David was saying, is that there's a huge opportunity to apply AI and large language models to the entire development life cycle, and not just focus on single phases or steps in the life cycle, but really looking at it at a workflow 
And so, because if you think about it, Copilot was initially just focused on the IDE, but for many other activities. And also, uh, shameless self-promotion, -prom like we have a paper on where we applied uh, GPT models on incident management, which is going to be presented on Friday. And the other really important direction is to help people build AI-powered software, because as we are speaking right now, software engineers are basically playing around with language models like GPT, and we are building software systems that they want to ship to customers. And so, so right now it's a little bit of it's a little bit of a wild west, right? Like people hack things together, um, and you can do prompts very quickly and show like uh, potential applications. But also, like how can we build, design, test, deploy AI systems in a very disciplined way going forward? The, the third uh, um, direction, and I think that's also similar to what David was saying, is about the, it's basically really important for us to think about the human uh, AI experiences and that, it, that we provide a great experience for humans to work with AI systems. And so if you think back about Copilot, like one of the reasons it was so successful was that they picked the perfect usage scenario and the perfect user experience for the model that they had and it was easy for people to basically take the recommendations, edit recommendations, but also it was a situation where people were, the software developers usually look at what is being recommended by co-completion systems. So basically what you have to do is design an experience that is seamless to the developer. The next, um, I think, interesting direction is, because there are many researchers here in this room as well, I think also AI can change the way that we do research, right? So if you think, for example, uh, you could use AI for, to help you with qualitative analysis of survey data, or you, AI can be like a great brainstorming partner to get some <laughs> research ideas or how you would design a research experiment, or you could put in your experiment and have uh, AI models critique what you could improve in the model. And again, it's important to keep in mind AI is not perfect and you need to oversee, just like in all of the other cases, that AI is doing the right thing. And uh, again, a slight uh, a parallel to David's talk, um, we have to think about how to apply AI in a responsible way. And that comes down to how we design and build systems that use AI in a responsible way that users can trust and also in a way that does not hurt or harm our society. And again, uh, we did some research in this space over last summer, and this is going to present it also on Friday in the afternoon. And this is basically about a trust framework that we can use for AI systems. So it's a future of a software engineering track, so I kind of have to make a prediction. But I also asked first uh, ChatGPT, like I, I spend a lot of time with ChatGPT, basically, do we still need software engineers in 10 years? And so ChatGPT is very confident that we still need software engineers. And basically it thinks we need software engineers for creative problem solving because that's what AI models can not do yet very well. We need to understand the user needs. And that's really important because one way you can think of this AI revolution is that a lot of the development activities are being shifted left so um, basically um, requirements engineering is going to get more important and also getting good specifications. Um, and also at the same time we have to think of like code might get less important over time because there could be some new abstraction on top of code. And the third, again, like ethics and oversight. And that's really, if I want you to take away one thing from today is that ethics and oversight is it's really important to to pay attention to because it's easy to forget about ethics when there's like a race to getting product chips. So as a human intelligence, so here's my prediction. Uh, so my prediction is that the SE process will look fundamentally different. Um, so the picture I showed you earlier, I don't think we will see the same picture in five to 10 years down the road. I don't know how it's gonna look. Um, if you can foresee the future, please let me know. 
Um, I am fairly confident, just like David showed, that AI agents are going to be a first-class member of software teams. And it's going to be really interesting to study how they work with humans. So that's why it's also really important to think about the human AI interaction aspects, because we need to get this right. Uh, one thing I couldn't touch much today is there's also this rise in open source AI models. So I think that's also a really promising direction that will have a lot of influence on how software is being developed. And um, I actually was very excited to see that we have a talk on technical debt in this session, because also as we are really building AI-powered software very quickly, we have to be very careful that we don't build up, or at least that we think about how to avoid uh, AI debt in our systems. The other important thing is software engineers, like they will need additional skills in the future because software engineering is going to change. And so again, I asked my friend ChatGPT, and so here are the skills that ChatGPT thinks that future software engineers need to, to be successful. And actually, I, it's a really good list, and I, I didn't have much to add. And so, <laughs> so that's my, um, um, it also was a bit, uh, uh, yeah, um, I, get a, I, did, I got a little bit of a feeling, oh, I'm going to be replaced slowly by ChatGPT, but like, that's a different story. But like, uh, so that's basically my talk, um, and I look forward to discussions around the future. Well, good day, esteemed researchers, software engineers, and distinguished guests. <laughs> I uh, must say I agree with uh, everything that Tom said in that talk. In today's talk, I'm going to be also talking about generative AI for software engineering. And this is joint work with um, several colleagues from Meta and also researchers from KAIST and King's College London. And uh, it, I should make a prediction for the future. So I'll predict that this paper is going to appear. Um, <laughs> I like safe predictions. Um, the organizers of this track are going to organize a post-conference proceedings uh, on future of software engineering. And the focus of this talk and the focus of the paper will be on large language models for software engineering. And uh, there are already enough papers on this area in the last 18 to 24 months to provide a, a, an interesting survey of the landscapes and also the open problems. And I've been very fortunate to work with um, colleagues Angela Fan, Belize Gokaya, and Shripo Sengupta from uh, the AI teams at Meta. So Angela is actually one of the lead engineers working on our LAMA um, large language model. Uh, Belize works on PyTorch and uh, uh, Shupo Sengupta is a leading researcher in FAIR. And myself and Mitya Lubarski are software engineers working on the infrastructure at Meta. And we're collaborating with Shin Hu from uh, you from KAIST and with uh, Jie Zhang from King's College London to produce this um, paper. And, they, they, and their thoughts, therefore, are also in this talk today. Uh, any mistakes are my fault, though, I should add. So I want to actually start by setting the scene of what we already know and what we've learned in the last uh, few decades in software engineering and how a lot of this is actually going to play an important role in hybridizing large language models. So we know that software engineers can introduce bugs into software systems, but we have developed many automated unit testing technologies that now provide a very good barrier to the kinds of trivial bugs that we used to see landing into software systems uh, maybe a decade or so ago. And this area uh, is well, ad well, well, ad well adapted and, and very mature now. Uh, one, one area that I'm, I'm particularly associated with and, and uh, would like to champion is search-based approaches to test data generation, but there are many, many others. And so I feel like as a community, we know how to generate uh, test data now, and this is going to prove important as we'll see. The other thing that's a more recent trend in software engineering is this idea that we can be much more cavalier about how we do transformations. So for example, if we have a bunch of lines of code, we can just selectively delete a line of code and see what happens. Of course, what often may happen is the, the code that, that may crash the system. And so we could carry on this approach of selectively deleting lines of code and seeing what happens and finding, because we have good integration tests, we can see that this will often cause a crash, but every now and then we get lucky. We find that, that piece of code we can delete and doesn't crash any, doesn't fail any tests. 
And that's a big win because we haven't just discovered dead code in a static analysis sense. We've discovered what we might call useless code, which is much more dynamic because we're really using testing now as our as our guard for what is what is correctness, what is faithfulness to the behavior we really care about for the system. We couldn't talk in this way. 10 years ago in software engineering because test adequacy simply wasn't there. But now the ability to generate high coverage test data means that we're able to talk about a kind of approach to software engineering which, which has come to be known as genetic improvement, where the idea is instead of correct by construction transformation, which was really the way in which software transformation was done from, from the 70s through till uh, only about six or seven years ago, we can now have this much more cavalier approach where we say, well, any test passing change is at least worth considering because our testing is sufficiently strong. And it's not, of course, just deleting code that we might consider. We can consider any transformation to the code. Essentially, we treat the code as if it's just genetic material to be manipulated. And uh, we use testing as our fitness to decide whether the, the change has improved some property that's, that's worth considering. Now, let's see how all that plays out with large language models. Many people, I'm, I'm sure, in this room have experimented with large language models. And the primary thing that we, we all encounter when we do this is that there are very powerful emergent behaviors. And the models, because of the, the incredible statistical pool of data on which they're trained, have the ability to synthesize apparent novelty. And, and there are, as I say, these emergent behaviors, which mean it, it goes beyond just really statistical learning from a, a corpus and being able to synthesize and produce what's been already seen to actually being able to not just synthesize novelty, but to understand new concepts or, or at least give the appearance of understanding new concepts. But what are the disadvantages? Well, they're actually the same. So these emergent behaviors lead to overgeneralizations and, and what in the AI community is known as hallucination. So hallucination is where a large language model will simply create output that is incorrect. In software engineering terms, it's a, it's a bug. And it's not really surprising because this is a technology that is uh, artificially intelligent and it genuinely deserves that, that moniker now. And we, we introduce bugs into software systems all the time. We hallucinate. Uh, sometimes we call that hallucination imagination, and it's creative, and sometimes it's uh, less, less valuable. So if the primary disadvantage of large language models is hallucination, and I claim that this is something that's baked into the, the technology and it's not going to go away anytime soon, we can only ameliorate it. It'll always be an issue. And for software engineers, what that means is essentially when we use large language models, we generate buggy code. Well, what's the solution? Well, it's only really a problem where there's no ground truth. So people have often talked about large language models for applications where you, you can't really, it, it's hard, let's say, it's a, it's a technical challenge to work out whether, whether the output is correct or not. But we're software engineers, we don't have that problem. We do have a ground truth. Uh, we, can auto, we can execute the software to check whether it behaves as we expect. And so observing code execution is a ground truth that will filter out hallucinatory responses. And this is why testing has always been important because it filtered out the, the hallucinations, if you will, of, of human engineers. Um, and it's why automation and automated test generation is going to be more important than ever. So if we look at the areas of application for large language models in, in software engineering. The, the area that's most well developed already is code completion. And Tom, Tom gave an excellent talk and, and I, I recommend his, uh, his, his paper on uh, taking flight with Copilot, um, which, which is a great survey of the existing understanding of how um, code completion can be used. And as Tom says, goes goes beyond what we used to think of as code completion. And if you haven't used any of these technologies, I strongly recommend you try them out. You, you will be very pleasantly surprised. One of the reasons why this area is already well developed is because we don't have the hallucination problem because we've got the human engineer right into the loop. The, the recommendations are occurring right in the IDE. But what about other uh, applications. How about test data generation? So we want to generate test cases, perhaps unit tests, perhaps corner cases, generate new tests, generate new assertions, i.e. I. new Oracle information in existing tests. This is also an area which is starting to emerge, and there are at least 20 papers on this topic alone. Um, and I think we can expect to see much more work on automatic generation of test cases, both in industry and in, uh, in academia. 
Refactoring is interesting. Uh, I haven't yet seen any papers on this topic. Incidentally, if you are working on, on this area and you have papers that are either out or about to appear, do let us know. We want to make sure they will appear in, in the survey, which we'll be um, publishing in, in July in the proceedings from this, this track. But I didn't find any papers yet on, on refactoring using large language models. And that's surprising because here we already have an automated oracle. We can, we can generate large amounts of tests and use the existing system as our as our Oracle. So we don't have the Oracle problem, which bedevils software testing. So refactoring ought to be something which we could do really well using large language models. Another area that has been well studied already in the last uh, 18 months is repair. There are already 20 or so papers on this. And uh, it's not surprising because we already have this genetic improvement framework in which we use a, a kind of generate and test approach to finding these genetic improvements and repairs. And large language models fit really neatly into that framework already. But what's uh, less well studied is performance improvement. And here I think there's potential for tremendous impact. Uh, if we can find ways to automatically improve the performance of software using large language models inside a kind of genetic improvement overall framework, then I think that the potential impact there could, could be the most dramatic we'll, we'll see from, from this area. Another interesting area that is starting to be considered, there are a few papers on this, not many, but a few, is documentation generation. And the interesting thing here is that unless you have an executable documentation, so like an executable specification or some kind of documentation that you can orchestrate in some way, then you're back to having this problem with hallucination. Um, fortunately, there are lots of techniques that are developing to deal with hallucination within the large language model community itself. So one that I particularly uh, like is this React framework where you do some reasoning and then you do some action. And the action, for example, could be uh, checking a ground truth. Uh, this has been experimented, for example, with Wikipedia, where researchers alternate between reasoning with the LLM and then the LLM calls out to an API to do actions like look up on Wikipedia and use this as a cross check. We could imagine something similar with documentation generation that might allow us, even in situations where we don't have a ground truth through testing and execution, to be able to use large language models productively. And, and finally, as uh, I think Tom mentioned in his talk, in the area of software analytics and also the related fields like uh, mining software repositories, there's tremendous potential here for us to use large language models after all. They are trained on enormous corpuses of data, and that's exactly what analytics and software repository mining is all about. So I think we're, we are in a very exciting field. It is going to be different and new, but also I think there are going to be many themes that we already understand uh, well, and we find that a lot of the research that's already taken place in this community will have will find new applications and new roles to play in hybrids with LLMs. Thank, thank you very much. All right, uh, so good afternoon, everybody, and thanks so much for having me. Um, so this is the non-AI talk, even though I'm going to circle back to AI and generative AI at the end. Since uh, Tom was kind enough to talk about technical debt in his talk, I thought I should uh, return the favor. Uh, so I'm going to talk about technical debt, a topic that's very dear to me, um, to a topic that we've been doing work for over the past decade or so. Um, technical debt, taking technical debt is a little bit like trying to fix something with duct tape. It's not really an elegant solution. It's not even a good solution, but it's a solution that works, at least for now. Um, you know that at some point you're going to have to go back and fix it properly uh, because it's going to start creating uh, more trouble for you. Uh, but, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a nice and easy solution for now that kind of solves your problem currently. Um, if we want to see this a bit more formally, we had a definition at a Dutch tool a few years ago that has stood the test of time. Uh, so there we define technical debt as design or implementation constructs. Uh, so a lot of people think of technical debt as code, uh, but it's actually also the early artifacts such as design, architecture, or even requirements. And those uh, are expedient in the short term, so they help us you know, meet our deadline or release the code uh, ahead of our competition, uh, some kind of business constraint like that. But eventually, this is going to make future changes more costly or even impossible. 
So this bottom line in the definition is also the bottom line of technical debt. Technical debt is about the cost of change. The more technical debt you accumulate into a system, the costlier it becomes to make changes in that system to build new features or fix bugs um, until eventually you know, it becomes impossible. It's way too expensive to make any kind of changes, which will probably cause management to pull the plug. Um, so a lot of people ask, okay, that sounds like you know, uh, a kind of uh, strange thing to talk about debt as in real money in software development. And how much does it actually cost? You know, how much technical debt can you find in systems? So there's been a few studies about that and the numbers, you know, sometimes differ from study to study. This one, for example, uh, it's already uh, about a decade ago. It put uh, in a very conservative scenario, it put technical debt to about $3.6 per line of code. I think in some systems, it's even much more expensive than that. But the uh, you know it, it really really depends on the application domain on the quality of the code and so on. Um, but the order of magnitude is about right. So modern uh, software systems that you know are, have a, let's say a few million lines of code also have a few million dollars of technical debt in them. And this is really the power of the metaphor. It's putting a dollar sign in a very technical aspect. If you're a software developer and you go to your manager and you, you talk to them about, uh, I don't know, cohesion and coupling, you know, they're gonna start rolling their eyes. But if you tell them, well, this part of the system has half a million dollar of technical debt, they start listening because then it becomes a risk that they will have to mitigate at some point. So uh, before I talk about the future, I just wanted to, to give a little bit of uh, the state of practice right now. If you go to most development teams and talk to the engineers, uh, you know most of them, if not all, will, will give you a definition of technical debt that's sort of aligned with what I said. So they understand what it is, and they also understand the challenges in managing technical debt. Um, they usually don't deal with it in a proactive way. So they don't just say, okay, folks, let's see how much technical debt we have and you know, what we should start paying back, what should we fix? They only do that during some maintenance activity, like you know, when they try to build a new feature, but that part of the system is a little bit too messy. Uh, it has too much debt, so it becomes difficult to build that feature, then they will uh, probably refactor first pay back some of the debt and then go ahead and do that uh, uh, implementation. And most of the teams, at least uh, in the studies that have been published uh, so far, seem to have some kind of technical debt management process or practice in place. So of course, a lot of the teams use uh, uh, source code analysis tools Sonar Cube seems to be the champion in this category in terms of calculating technical debt. And a lot of the teams also use these tools together with um, quality gates. Uh, so, you know, developers will not be able to commit code uh, when the technical debt is uh, above a certain threshold. Um, you also see that many developers nowadays tag technical debt in their issue tracker so that you know uh, you have all of the technical debt items grouped together as you would have the uh, defects or security vulnerabilities. And that's a good thing because technical debt kind of becomes a category of its own when people look at their backlog and they think about what to do next. So that was practice. Now, let me talk a little bit about research. <clears throat> We've been doing work on this for at least 10 years and we made a lot of progress, but I have to admit that, let's say the past few years, we've been doing a little bit of lamppost research and I'm not excluding myself. I think I'm guilty of the same thing as well. 
Uh, so land post research means that you know you, you've lost your keys in a dark alley, but you're trying to find them under the the land post because it's there's light there. You didn't lose them there, but it's easier to look under the the, the, the land post. In terms of technical debt research, uh, this means that we basically have been looking into code technical debt, uh, which is the easy part. It's easy to take a tool like SonarCube and then analyze 100 Apache projects and you know come up with all sorts of statistics about how much that is there and how much it evolves and so on, which is fine. You know, you, you learn some things about this and we have uh, made some progress as a community, but uh, the, the somewhere in the dark quarters, there's the most, the more important kind of architect of technical debt, which is the architecture technical debt. And this is not really something we're looking into so much. And that's a bit of a pity. Heuristically speaking, the um, 2080 rule applies here. So architecture technical debt accounts for about 20% uh, of the whole technical debt in the system, but it, it also accounts for 80% of the cost of change. So this is, you know, architecture technical that is really impactful when it comes to software development, especially maintenance and evolution, but we're not really looking into that so much. Um, but not all hope is lost. Uh, thankfully, the past couple of years, we've actually been working exactly on this and we've been seeing some approaches that are trying to shed light on this dark side of the technical debt spectrum, which is the architecture technical debt. Um, we've been uh, seeing tools that perform uh, static source code analysis that actually detect technical debt, mostly in the form of architecture smells and particularly dependency-based architecture smells. So things like cycles, uh, hubs, and so on. So there's tools like Arcan and Deviate, for example, that have been doing a very decent job in detecting this kind of architecture technical debt. In addition to that, uh, there is the so-called self-admitted technical debt. So this is text that developers have written, for example, in source code, they say to do fix me. Uh, so that's technical debt uh, admitted by the developers themselves. And in the past couple of years, we've been seeing uh, researchers mine code comments, issue trackers, pull requests, commit messages, trying to detect also um, self-admitted technical debt at the architecture level. And this is becoming more and more successful. We're getting uh, better and better at that. Mind that self-admitted technical debt techniques are not exclusively focusing on architecture debt but they are certainly including that as well. So the, there is a little bit of progress. And now let me try to look into my crystal ball and, and give you my vision about what I see will happen in the next few years based also on uh, development on other fields. So these tools that we've, we've been uh, coming up with to uh, detect and measure architecture technical debt, uh, those that use uh, source code analysis, but also those that mine software repositories, and particularly code comments, issue trackers, uh, commits, and pull requests, we're going to see uh, tools that combine these sources. And that's very important because um, each one of these source tells a different story, but if you put them all together, you actually can have a very comprehensive picture of all of the architecture technical debt uh, into your system. And what will this be used for? Well, the first one is documentation. Uh, I think Mark mentioned this in his talk just before that we're going to see uh, automated documentation, AI tools that are able to kind of automatically generate documentation. Uh, this is exactly what we envision to happen also in the field of architecture technical debt. It is an expensive uh, activity to document technical debt. So tools that are able to do that automatically will, will start uh, showing up. 
the second one is the measurement of technical debt. Uh, so far, we've been good at measuring the principle of the debt, but not the interest. So the interest refers to the extra effort it takes to make a change because of the existence of technical debt. This is not something we're good at right now, but I think we're going to get much better at doing that, especially if we combine these multiple data sources that I, that I just mentioned. And finally, uh, we'll see tools that are doing much better monitoring of technical debt. So the problem with technical debt is that sometimes it surprises you. You know, it has accumulated so much into the system that you have reached the point of no return and uh, there has been no red flag anywhere. Uh, so we're going to see tools that kind of uh, uh, show up in, in the dashboard. Uh, you know, every time you uh, write a code comment about architecture, technical debt, or you uh, write an issue about that, then it's going to kind of be, get integrated into this dashboard so that you can see how much uh, technical debt is accumulating, how it's evolving, and uh, give you a little bit of warning on, on how to to sort of proceed from there. <clears throat> so I promised to, to give a little bit of generative AI in my talk and that's it. Um, so in addition to the tools that I just mentioned, I think we're going to see also the use of uh, generative AI tools for this uh, field as well. <clears throat> um, so tools like ChatGPT and Copilot are going to be used, if not themselves, at least we're going to see some uh, uh, tools using uh, uh, you know, similar technologies. Uh, one of the applications here would be to prevent technical debt. So we will see tools that are conversational, such as ChatGPT, that are able to kind of discuss with the software developers and try to offer them the options they have. So if they want to go with a quick and dirty uh, solution, this is fine, but they should uh, know the consequences and it should be explicit, but the tool can also provide them with alternatives on you know, what other solutions exist that might be better and, and incur less debt. These tools could also help with prioritizing which technical debt items to repay. So at this moment, we are really bad at that as well. Prioritization, if you run a, you know, a tool like SonarCube, it will give you a priority, but most developers will completely disregard that and they will you know, follow their own uh, intuition on which one is more important. I think large language models are going to help tremendously there as well. And they will get much better at predicting which item should have the, the best priority. And finally, again, Mark mentioned this as well in his talk, we're going to see uh, these tools that work a little bit like Copilot and uh, suggest refactorings. Uh, right now we can do uh, refactorings at let's say code level, but we cannot do that at the architectural level. I think we are going to see uh, tools that work at a much higher scale at the architectural level and suggest refactorings to, to software developers so that they can, you know, get some help in fixing the debt. Um, let me complete my talk. This is my last slide. <clears throat> uh, this is for those of you that are kind of working in this field, uh, even in, in a more remote sense. So as I mentioned, you know, we've, we've been doing a bit of lamppost research. We've done too much work on code debt. Nobody needs any more sonar cube studies. Please stop doing that. Let's focus on what really matters. Let's focus on the architecture, the design issues. This is what really makes an impact in software development. Um, and second, uh, the concept of technical debt is sometimes used to refer to everything that is wrong in software development. <laughs> you know, you see people saying, I have uh, social debt in my system, I have defect debt, I have security debt. This is all very nice, but it's not really technical debt, so we're kind of diluting the metaphor here. Technical debt is about the cost of change, and I think we should really keep it to that. Um, finally, if you're a tool developer, um, a lot of the tools that are <clears throat> claiming they are 
measuring and detecting technical debt right now are not always doing that. <clears throat> so they use the word technical debt, but they are you know, detecting something different and measuring something different. If you are developing tools in this area, I would really uh, welcome you to make the definition of these qualities very explicit, define the metrics that you use and how you calculate repayment. And if you use tools like SonarCube, you know, they will give you the repayment effort, how much time it takes to fix something. And most of the people don't trust this because it's not you know, aligned with their own experience. So tool developers should be much more uh, open and upright about how they actually define all of these things. Um, and finally, we need some benchmarking because these tools are very good, but we have no way of comparing them against each other. We really miss benchmarks. Uh, so if you do work in this area, please contribute data sets that can act as benchmarks for us to, to be able to compare those tools. And that was my 10 minutes of fame. Thank you so much for your attention. If you guys have any questions, please stand up and ask the questions. Okay. Thank you everyone for uh, great talks. I, I have a question for David. Uh, for your symbiotic workforce, uh, you listed three properties, if I remember correctly, and one was autonomy, and there was intelligence, and then the third one was responsible. Do you look at it as like a functional guarantee, or do you see beyond responsible? Because that, that's, I think, is a very challenging one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry for making you uh, run back and forth. <laughs> yes. So thank you very much Shin, for the questions. Yeah, so I yeah I think that, that for the future I think that would be good to look into uh, intelligent, also a responsible and autonomous, and I think uh, auto being autonomous and also being responsible at that time at the same time I think is uh, very important. So responsible I think in a way that it should provide some kinds of guarantee. Guarantee is very difficult for AI, right? Uh, but if we can somehow provide uh, AI, maybe combine it together with verification. So we have two directions of research, I think, so far, like AI for software engineering and software engineering for AI. Can we possibly combine them together so that we can build these tools that developers can use and provide some kinds of guarantee? How exactly that can be done uh, is still an open question, but I think it's very important if you want to transition from smart tools to, a, let's say, a smart workmate, like we have a workmate, that workmate need to be responsible. They need to provide certain kind of guarantee that their work is somehow good. So at the moment, so far, AI is like a best effort. I produce something, you like it or not, it's up to you. But then that limits the ability of AI maybe to be a smart tool, just an assistant to us. Can we go beyond that? I don't have an answer, just a lot of questions. <laughs> yes, thank you. So my question is also for David. It's a little open-ended, but I guess I was just wondering, how do you visualize like the work distribution between the bots and like the humans? Because I guess anecdotally, when I or like a friend or colleague uses ChatGPT in their job, they usually use it to do the kind of boring grunt work that like you don't really want to do, and then you're sort of freed up to do the more like critical thinking sort of stuff. Is that sort of what you would? like visualize in the future or do you think of it more of like you're like a on equal standing with the with the AI? Thank you very much. So thank you very much for the question. I think that's a, a very excellent question. How exactly can we distribute this uh, workload? I think like if we talk about like a symbiotic workforce, so uh, basically everyone need to play a role. So uh, I, I agree with uh, what Tom mentioned, actually, like one uh, difficulty of AI at the moment is uh, creative thinking. So I think that kind of job is still far from what AI can do at the moment. So maybe what our creative can be left for humans. But on the other hand, uh, I also agree with Mark, say that uh, now AI can do a lot of hallucination. Hallucination is good and bad. So in the good way, maybe they ha it hallucinates things that are 
uh, creative and maybe it can help human as well. So we can see an example of artists actually, they created some very beautiful image using AI and won certain kind of awards. So I think the definition of what kind of work go to human, what kind of work goes to the AI, is still a little bit blur at the moment. So at the moment, maybe human do more creative stuff. Uh, AI is a bit uncertain. Sometimes it's creative, sometimes it's hallucinating. What exactly can we do with AI? So I think we are still defining the boundaries there. And it's great for us to be able to define that boundary together, but making sure that we actually cater to the ethical principles also. We do not want AI to take over everything and then all the software engineers lose the job. Maybe they can do research as good as us as well. <laughs> yeah, but that's an exciting question. Again, I don't have answers, just a lot of questions and good to discuss together. Thank you. I have a comment for Paris first and then a question. Paris, this is Ipek. How could you miss the golden opportunity? LLMs will do nothing but introduce technical debt. The, first de the next decade is the golden age of technical debt research. <laughs> but related to that, uh, David, you mentioned that uh, trust is an issue by developers. I think we're observing the opposite, over trust in these tools. And because of that, all the potential consequences, whether the tools are exciting, how, how do we balance that? Isn't there, I think for the first time we're seeing developers overexcited and using these tools in some areas, they're doing great things, but there are a lot of risks as well. So how do you balance that? I think this is probably all of you because all of you mentioned, but I'll, we can start. Yeah, thank you very much, Ipek. I, I agree with you. I think at the moment, people are very excited. People are using it. Like even in the education sector, we are a bit worried because the students just copy paste answer from ChatGPT. <laughs> so I think yeah, there's a, a lot of uh, trust, but I think this is a misplaced trust. So the question is, how can we uh, still use these tools, but then uh, inform developers that uh, what are the limitations of these tools? The problem with AI is very malleable. Right, uh, that's the problem and also the benefit of AI is very malleable, it can build many different things. But how can we uh, characterize the limitations of AI? How can we educate people in which they can use AI in a way that will be beneficial? So I think uh, like uh, lack of trust uh, is, is, uh, is a question for some people. Too much trust is a problem to some people. How to get the right level of trust? And how can we have that responsible level of trust and we can increase that level of trust maybe by providing certain kind of explanation, providing certain kinds of guarantees, combining AI with something else. For example, recently there is a work done in the AI community called Toolformer, and I like it because like, uh, if the problem is simple, like mathematical, like six plus three equals to what? Why do we need to build a large language models for that? We can just use a calculator. So maybe we should divide and conquer the job. Let AI do what AI is good at. Let calculator do what this calculator is good at. And maybe we can have that right level of trust. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my question is uh, for Tom, uh, I guess, so you mentioned that requirements will become uh, more important uh, with AI taking over most part of the uh, code development. But can this emergence of uh, large language models also impact uh, requirements engineering as well? Because the synergy between natural language in both of these. What do you think with David's vision of the holistic uh, approach of integrating AI at various levels would play in requirements field? So, so, so I think like one way to think of it is, so, so I think AI and large language models, they're going to affect everything, like every single phase in the software development process. But one, in certain phases, you will still need more human impact, uh, you, human input, right? So, so if you think about requirements engineering, you need someone who basically figures out what system should be built, how to describe it, and then eventually in a world in the future, basically fits the input for the AI model and maybe can figure out what to build. And so, so that's why I think it's really important to think about the requirements phase. Like how do we tell models what to build, basically? 
And so, so like David had in his slides, like the Star Trek, uh, like the data from Star Trek. And fact, that's actually also how I think a lot about these, these large language models. Because in a way, like data from, from Star Trek, that's like how AI might look like in the future. Um, and so basically it's some really smart system with which we communicate. The system can do a lot of things, like data can write great programs. One thing it doesn't have is like humor, so he's still trying to learn what's funny. So there are gonna be some limitations and it's really important for us to figure out what these limitations are and also to build up like an appropriate trust relationship with these AI systems. Okay, thanks Prof, for your presentation. So, we, because of this track, we're talking about the future of the software engineering. So, I, I, as, I, as I saw the presentation in Thomas, it's, it, it, it's talking about now the co-pilot is only about uh, coding, but also for the whole software, uh, software engineering, or not only coding, but also we're including debugging and blah, 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 all of these things. But it's this, this question is not only to co-pilot, but maybe for the, la, the Lama or some, or based on your experience or expect, uh, do you think how long it will take for the AI or can, can do some creative uh, things, just like uh, find a new algorithm to create a new pattern for the software engineering? So do you have in three or five years, or oh, I, I want to know what's your option is to all. Uh, I mean, I, I honestly, I don't know. Um, I, if I were to bet, I would think probably three to five years, you will see some signs that it can do, can do, do really creative stuff, right? And it also comes down to what you, like what level you expect. So one thing I've been playing around a little bit is just taking like um, um, like research ideas and just putting into ChatGPT and asking how would you address this problem or like how would you address this research? And it actually comes up with a really good research plan. And then if you combine it with some of the uh, techniques that David was mentioning, um, uh, for example, like Langchain, where you put like orchestra orchestration in place where you just delegate certain activities to other tools, you're already at like a stage where you can start do certain types of analysis in an automated way. And so I think that's gon only gonna get more quickly that we get to this stage. So I think in, in three to five years, you're gonna see some really crazy stuff of creativity and then, yeah. And I, I'm curious how it's gonna look like in 10 years. <laughs> This is Didi Arzuri from CSIRO's Data 61. Um, I wanted to ask a question. Thank you very much, first, first of all, for sharing your visions. Um, in relation to the applications of AI in many different sectors, we observe uh, in recent years that uh, a lot of the approaches uh, to looking after the um, ethics of AI and eth AI ethics in, in general, uh, people are looking at risk assessment and risk-based frameworks and uh, basically looking at risk and developing risk assessment. I just wondered what is your thoughts about applications of AI in software engineering and whether we really need to also perhaps look through the uh, risk lens and see what are the uh, risks for uh, using AI in many of these different application uh, areas that uh, you all um, discussed, like a technical debt or co-piloting and all of that. Uh, should we really be uh, thinking about assessing the risks beforehand and thinking about the uh, ethics of AI, um, you know, before you actually go overboard and applying it in that many ways that you were in envisioning? Thank you. So I think that's an excellent question, like uh, well, how can we uh, uh, 
uh, think more about uh, AI. I think like a few months ago, I think there is a number of AI experts there that stop making AI more and more smarter until we really know the consequences of AI. So I think the same should be said also for AI for SE. We really need to know what are the limitations of it before we proceeding further. I think, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, our group do a little bit of things that analyze the code that AI produces and we just run some static analysis to check if there is any problem like technical depth and other things. And we find that indeed it would introduce a lot of technical depth. And, and I agree with like what Mark mentioned that uh, sometimes AI is like two-edged sword. Like on one hand, like it can get more and more creative. On the other hand, it gets more and more hallucinating. So I'm, I think before, we need to really understand that because like, let's say we have a superpower GPT, like GPT-7, for example. Maybe it produces wonderful code that nobody think about, but the problem is that is nobody think about it. There's a lot of problem that nobody know, right? And then maybe we need to better understand that before we proceed further on that direction. I agree with you, thank you. Well, yeah, I think absolutely we have to think about ethics before we build anything. And because I think there's a, there's a really big risk that we build the wrong things. And maybe like the AI for SE case is maybe a little bit less um, problematic than like if you think about health or, or like more general models, right? Like there's so many bad things that can, people can do with AI. So it's really important to think about how we can prevent some of it. And it's also not just it's also part of the software engineer's responsibility to think about it, because they might be the ones who really have expertise to see all the things that could go wrong. And so that's what's really important. Can I add something to the uh, same uh, question? So uh, thinking about the topic of risk, uh, there is certainly a lot of risk coming with these technologies and uh, using them, especially when they're not uh, properly supervised and vetted. But I, I would like to offer also the reverse uh, viewpoint that these are technologies that can also help us with mitigating risk. So for example, in the case of technical debt, um, this is a typical risk that exists in most uh, large and complex and long-lived systems. Uh, but using these tools can help us to manage these risks better because they can help us to better uh, identify them, measure them, monitor them, and make sure that you know uh, technical debt doesn't accumulate over a certain threshold. So while the technologies themselves have risks, we should also embrace the fact that these are very intelligent uh, technologies that can also help us to mitigate risk to the, especially in cases where human beings might uh, sometimes get bogged down with complexity and are not able to uh, kind of handle all of the different um, factors that come into play. Uh, so we should try to take advantage of that as well and look how we can use these technologies to handle risk also in software development. Thank you. Uh, hi, Tom. Uh, Kevin Jesse, UC Davis. Uh, we just talked a lot about expectation and trusting these generation models and whatever they generate. Um, and you at Microsoft have a unique opportunity to track what is uh, included in the code base by Copilot or not. Uh, is there any flagging uh, that you do or maybe metrics of how many human eyes have looked over the code and said pass by and hadn't seen any issues with it? Um. I mean, so, so we did do some studies where we looked at how much uh, basically people accept the recommendations and how much of these are being um, basically accepted without edits, with edits, or um, completely rejected. And so I, um, so this is not what our team worked on. So that's a sister team that was doing the research, and I don't know what exactly is published. So I'm a bit. Um, I, I don't know what I can really tell about it, but basically yeah, we've done some some studies where we looked into like what what people accept and how many edits are being made. So 
and maybe some, some background on, I think what I can talk a little bit about is, so once Copilot was released, it was actually a really, it was, it was a big shift in Microsoft Research, where basically a lot of teams were looking into how people are working with software, with, with Copilot, and not just software engineering research team, a lot of AI, ML teams were looking at it, also like HCI teams were looking at it, um, so, so like Ipek mentioned, like the people might trust too much. So there's like a strong focus of research on over-reliance, like do people just accept them or not? And like what are security implications? So there's a lot of research about Copilot itself just to, to understand how people are using it and also to make sure that whatever is being released is a, a safe system for, for people to use. Yeah, so, so the question was about long-term perspective, like if the code ages, um, not just the short term. Um, so I don't, um, I don't think we did long-term studies. And part of it is because it's also complicated to check over longer times which pieces of code survive and which ones are being written by Copilot. But I think it's a really interesting direction to think about like what parts of a system is written by humans, which part of a system is written by AI, and also from a from a legal perspective, right? Because certain certain disciplines you might not be allowed to use tools like Copilot, and so there you want to be able to prove that you wrote all the code by yourself. Or, so I think the interesting future directions as well to figure out what's AI, what's what's human written, and I think that's also one risk you're facing right now is because there's not much in place to track what's AI written. And so over time, we will have this huge corpus of, of documents and we just don't know which one is human, which one is AI. Can I ask a question to you? Can I ask a question for Tom? Yes. So, so I also very interested in what like the activities done like in open AI, like, uh, uh, they're, they're, like the data is being frozen at the moment is 2021. Like is that, are there a uh, plan maybe? I don't know if you can share like to include more data, will they create problems? Because like libraries continue to be upgraded, like new versions of code deprecated libraries, how to deal with that? Because if the data is frozen, so, so I think these are all really great questions. Uh, I I have as much insight into OpenAI as you do. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I I sometimes find out maybe about a new model a, a few days before you, but not that much. So. Thank you. Hi. So uh, this question is addressed to Mark and Paris because you guys look lonely. Uh, Hi, it's Rick Kaysman. I don't know if, I don't think you can see me. Um, so Mark, the kinds of changes that you talked about uh, tended to be quite localized that you're using in your tests. And Paris, the kinds of refactorings that you were talking about tended to be non-local. So if you're doing a design refactoring, you're typically making many coordinated changes in different parts of the code base simultaneously. Now, it, I would be a foolish person to bet against large language models, but that, do, that kind of refactoring seems orders of magnitude harder than the little tweaks that, that Mark, you were talking about and, and then testing. Do you think that these approaches can scale up uh, or, or is this something that, that requires a different kind of reasoning? Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, so at least for large-scale refactorings, there is one low-hanging fruit, and that's uh, <clears throat> dependency-based architecture smells. This is also what's the most uh, mostly done at the state of the art. So when we look at the architectural level uh, problems or technical debt, uh, this is, you know, the, the first thing that kind of uh, pops up and makes people's life difficult. And this has to do with dependencies between large component or large packages. 
Um, so this is probably the easiest uh, starting point that we could take to be able to have uh, large language models trained and suggest refactorings. But I have to admit, I have no confidence in on how far this would actually work. Uh, this is something that is still, uh, you know, uh, this has to be proven in practice. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I guess I would, just to follow on, it, it does seem to me like every software system is its own small language model, which would need to be learned, and, and that might be part of the complexity. But Mark, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for the question. So um, one of the interesting things about the uh, emergent properties is this few-shot learning ability. And I think that this is, in, in terms of refactoring, a very exciting opportunity because on the one hand with refactoring, if we know it's a meaning-preserving refactoring, which many are, and about a third of engineers' time is spent on refactoring. So it's a, a big effort opportunity there. And it's not the most exciting job, let's face it. So most engineers would be delighted if a technology could take that, that tedium away from them. So with the few shot learning, I think what's really exciting is that rather than just refactoring according to well-known design patterns, which I'm sure these models would be good at because they're, they're, they're trained on such large corpus of data and there's so many examples out there. But with the few shot learning, you can do this kind of bespoke refactoring where you say, in my particular project, I want to change the way I use this API in this way. And I give a few examples and now I want to just scale that out across the entire code base. And of course, the, the real problem right now with, you know, once again, the hallucination problem comes in that, that some of those uh, changes will be correct and some won't be. But if we also have a large scale, high coverage automated test data generation, then we, we have a filter. So now put those two technologies together and you've got a great approach to very bespoke refactoring. And this may well address a large number of technical death issues, I think, and allow us to move faster in that sense. But to come back to your question about um, scale and scalability. I think what happens when we have new technologies like this is that humans essentially just move up the abstraction chain. And it'd be very, very interesting to see how that plays out with this technology. So if we compare with what happened with high level languages over a much larger period, we moved up the abstraction chain as engineers. Very few engineers now don't trust the compiler and look in to see what kind of assembler code it generates. But that's because compilers are very highly correct by construction. I mean, Zhen Dong Su's work and others on fuzzers have shown that there are surprising bugs still in compilers, but they're very reliable. And, and, and there are techniques to prove correctness of the transformations they do. If we move into a world where we've moved up the abstraction chain, but what is now the new object code is actually largely generated by a machine, and there's this potential for hallucination, then I think we are in a, in a, in a different world. It'll resemble perhaps um, a step back from situations where lots of bugs get caught at compile times or getting caught at runtime. And as software engineers, we do need to think about how to manage that 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 situation. I don't know if that answered your question, Rick. Oh, that Best was, I've I, got to offer. I'm not sure, but it was a fascinating answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so actually back to uh, David's questions regarding API deprecations. So I think I uh, personally want to highlight about uh, uh, version of weirdness. So basically, I like I personally haven't seen that Copilot and other AI language mod like large language models of the code. So they have to like version of weirdness. So basically, like different from nature language. So program language actually evolves quickly. So like there will be tons of uh, versions in different kinds of program language and also libraries. So. Um, I personally would say like there will be a future development like in this area. So what's your perspective uh, on these things like uh, regarding the version of witness? I think that's a, a very good question. It's like uh, yeah, uh, there's a number of language, uh, programming language continue to evolve. Also some libraries continue to be updated, there are deprecation in it. And uh, training a huge, large language models takes a lot of effort. So how can we uh, deal with it? So in my opinion, I think uh, uh, there, there are different types of language models being developed. According to Wikipedia, the smallest is actually BERT. The largest is actually GPT-4. So there is uh, different ways to learn. One way to learn is to just fine tune all the parameters, right, with the small models. And the big models, we just have an in-context learning, like a few-shot learning that Mark has mentioned. So I think there is opportunities here 
uh, for us to actually maybe deal with this versioning issue by working with the smaller language model, but let that smaller model learn from the bigger model. So there is a lot of work done on, for example, uh, student teacher learning. So can we make the large models to be a, uh, like a, a teacher and then like the small models to be a student and then we fine tune it with the later, uh, later data. Maybe we can deal with the versioning issue in that sense. So the big model haven't seen the new version but it can learn a lot more and the small model can see the data about the latest version and then we can tune and adapt it like that. So that's just some thoughts that I have. Uh, regarding the mixture of experts. So basically, in the layers, they provide different kinds of experts. So ex actually take, like considered as a ex like um, modules. So like by sh like switching uh, like around these kinds of experts, so basically I, I probably will have a thought. So what if we can actually build on these kind of techniques of mixture expert to create different kinds of version awareness? I think that's exciting to have a, a multiple experts. I, I, for me, I think the best future in the, is actually one that is not monopolized by one player. So at the moment, the best is like a chat GPT, open AI. I hope in the future there are a lot of alternatives and this uh, smart, intelligent agents can interact with each other, discover their own capabilities, and then at the end do something that is emerging, not just from one large language models, but multiple large language models working together with humans, and maybe they can deal with the version problem and more. I agree with you. I'm afraid that there is not much time left. Uh, so for, please forgive me to ask uh, the last question about uh, what are the differences of the research and applications in the AI and the SE field from uh, industry and uh, academia perspectives? So, so what are the differences between industry? Um, yeah, I don't think, uh, I don't see the many differences. I think, um, I think one difference right now maybe for industry is that there is a lot of uh, excitement around AI and uh, basically there's also a lot of push to build something using AI and there's like a really like a rush going on in a way and so I think well, probably, probably in academia is there's maybe also a little bit of a rush, but maybe not as crazy as in uh, as in industry. So that, um, yeah, I don't know what David thinks, but Thanks. I, I I agree with Tom. And uh, another problem I'd like to share, like in in academia, we don't have too much money to buy all the GPUs. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we need to rely on industry uh, to build these uh, foundational models that maybe can share with us and then we can build on top of it and then uh, maybe we can innovate further together with the industry. Yeah, in, I understand that there's something, a lot of push in some companies to build some things in the matter of months, while in the academia we can build something in the matter of years and maybe we can work together uh, in, in that way. Industry has a lot of resources, has a lot of GPUs. We have maybe a little bit more time, less pressure, and we can work together. Yes, just my two cents. Hey, Prabhu Han, what do you think Hi. about this question? Well, that, it's a very interesting question. I agree with what Tom said. There is there is the classic difference between the two where we're, we're, we're the different speed at which things move. But I think one thing is interesting is the way that this, this new area that's rapidly emerging can have the potential to bring together academia and industry. I mean, more than ever before, my my, my, my experience is that practicing engineers are, are turning to archive and reading papers from academics. Um, perhaps one interesting thing is the way that this might change the field of publishing for academics. Like, I've noticed now that I, I almost every paper I've read in the last uh, few weeks on this topic has been an archive. And, and that might be an interesting um, development for, for, that will change the, the way academic publishing takes place because the field is moving so fast now that really waiting six months or a year for your paper to come out is just is just a non-starter. Um, and 
Yeah, so I think that there's a very positive message here, which is that academia and industry have lots of opportunities to work much more closely together because there's, it's as if suddenly we have this, this foundational field where there's things are going on in parallel all over the place. And uh, so there's lots of opportunities. There's lots of greenfield research problems and there's plenty of people in industry who are listening to, to the results that are coming out of academia. Thanks. Uh, Prof. Paris, what do you think about well, I think in academia, we mostly uh, try to, we, we have the luxury to play around with these technologies by, uh, you know, uh, giving student projects and, you know, that they, they can take their time, read the literature and then build models and play around. Uh, industry is, I think, a, a little bit more pressing and they have to solve immediate problems. Um, so they have to actually deliver things more, more quickly. Uh, I think in academia, we're in, I mean, a bit more of a, a comfortable situation. Uh, but I, I have to agree with, with Mark that this is a, a, an area that we can really come together and solve common problems uh, because we are both interested and need uh, have the need to use those technologies to, to solve problems. So I, I think we can take this as a kind of a positive message that uh, this should be a bridge for academia and industry to collaborate and, and try to solve uh, problems that can benefit uh, both parties. Many thanks. Uh, I'm afraid this session is coming to an end. Uh, we have a hot discussion. Um, maybe you have many questions to our invited speakers. Uh, Maybe we can have we can discuss more during the coffee break. Many thanks to the Prof. Lo and uh, Dr. Zimmerman and uh, Prof. Hamer and Prof. Paris. Thanks. Thank you.